Rav Cook, Selected Letters, Chapter 1 on the Topic of Torah and Science, Letter Number 4. This letter is included in this section since it discusses aspects of the Torah's view of psychology, but it contains many other matters as well. Rav Cook, like modern psychologists, argues that dreams are representations of emotions and desires in the dreamer's subconscious, but sees them as positive expressions of the soul's desire to love God. He also discusses the religious value of fasting, noting that fasting in general is permitted only of a person who is fit enough to bear self-affliction, and hinting that today, when the spiritual state of the world is at a nadir, people do not have enough spiritual strength to take additional fasts upon themselves. All this comes as a prelude to an explanation of the dream fast, a fast undertaken by one who has, a, who has had a bad dream. At the beginning of the letter, Rav Cook discusses the tolerance of ideas and distinguishes between recognizing that all ideas have a divine source, which he advocates, and the attitude that all ideas should be equally valued, which he condemns. By the grace of God, the holy city of Jaffa may be built and established 12th of Tammuz 5667, that's the 24th of June 1907. To the venerable scholar, our guide, Rav E. Newworth, long life to him, peace and blessings. Your letter has reached me, and I was very happy to see that you have chosen a book that engages one's heart and feelings in the depths of Torah and the service of God. And I very much wanted to shed light with my limited abilities on all your questions at length, but I am extremely occupied now and must respond with utmost brevity and cite just fixed laws according to what is clear to my heart. I will tell you, sir, a most important principle the most enlightening outlook on the subject of religious beliefs and views, as with all lofty matters, involves leaving the narrow sphere where one finds conflicting opinions that are hostile towards each other or completely negate each other, and to reach the lofty peak from which the roots of all opinions can be seen. For all opinions rise to one place and are differentiated only due to different conditions of ways of life and the states of souls, and the mature, and the mature researchers using common sense joined with clear and correct emotions, know how to appreciate the value of everything and how to integrate all the opinions in such a way that each one completes what is lacking in the other even when they seem to be conflicting. This is the lofty outlook that stems from the true divine perception of God as He who is able to accomplish all things and is omnipotent. Uh, this is a quote, a footnote, this is a quote from the Musaf service for the new year from the prayer and all believe. Back to the text. And one must be very careful to, di to differentiate between this inclusive outlook, which knows how to penetrate each viewpoint and to appreciate each feeling according to the depth of its value, and between the cold tolerance which stems from the spiritual world not occupying its proper place in the soul. Another footnote. According to Rav Cook, there are two types of tolerance regarding ideas. The first which he supports is a recognition that all ideas have a divine source and therefore must have some must have some value. The second which he condemns is an apathetic tolerance of any idea and disrespect for the importance of divine truth. Back to the text. The latter must recede from the light and brightness of life, while the former will grow and blossom forever at a greater level, until the day when the land is full of the knowledge of the Lord. For then they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my sacred mountain Israel. A quote from Ishayahu 11.9 And with the attainment of scientific wealth and the elaboration of each theory in detail, the power of the original peace which unifies all things will be very great. And now let us get back to fasts. We see with our own eyes that the whole world, especially the world of life, is improved not by the joining of limited powers that are working each within its own bounds, rather by the joining of powers with each one striving to expand beyond its bounds. When the powers meet, they press and check each other, and it is through such jostlings that the phenomenon of life comes into being. This is the law in nature, and it is so even in the nature of mind and ethics. And this is the radiant light of loving kindness, the sphere of chesed, of life which is always filled in all its facets from the source of the infinite, so that they, the powers, cause life both in their state of strength and bursting forth, and in the state of being pressed and contained. And therefore the physical forces of men must be healthy and full, not only, the, not only to the extent required by ethical bounds, 
but to a greater extent. This is how things should be when the world is in its correct state. The extra physical energy should properly be channeled into an effort into an effort toil for the lofty ethic. This labor is the toil of Torah and the commandments. In order to deepen their impression and to strongly fix their value on life, these have obstacles opposing them, whether social obstacles or obstacles originated in mankind's aspirations not being properly matured. It is through this dialectic called struggle that it, the extra flow, fulfills its purpose. Man was also not created such that he would not sin at all. Rather, he should be wary of sin, and if he errs and sins, he should repent. Repentance itself is also a wondrous awakening of life. From the general point of view, looking at existence as a whole, the engagement in destruction for the sake of building anew is also called construction. It is therefore understood that the individual who has more powers than he actually needs, above what is required for the sensitivities of the required service, prayer, sacrifices, etc., so that even the toil needed for research and study are insufficient to set his powers in the proper proportion. For him, fasting becomes a holy duty, in most cases necessary in accordance with his physical condition, as certainly for his ethical well-being. Only the wild tendency towards gluttony will somewhat suffer, and this is just an added beauty to the, to the desired goals of a fast. But all the parts of the body and soul will gain value and beauty as well as harmonious strength. This is the fast glorified by Torah, by Torah sages. Therefore, it is self-evident that at the time when the world is imperfect, and due to the defective practices of the blemish civilization, the powers are deficient, to the extent that not only does man not have a surplus of strength required for practical and theoretical work, but he lacks much of what is necessary, then fasting is a sin and not a commandment. A footnote. These two different attitudes toward fasts can be found in the Talmud. Samuel said, Whoever fasts for the sake of self-affliction is termed a sinner. Rabbi Eliezer said he is termed holy. In the continuation of the discussion, Rabbi Eliezer contradicts himself. The Talmud reconciles this conflict by explaining that one instance speaks of a person who is able to bear self-affliction, while the other speaks of one who is not able. This is from Gemara Ta'anit 11a and b. Back to the text. This also applies somewhat to the national fasts, which we observe in commemoration of the temple's destruction. The lack of the national service, the prayer services and the sacrifices, which destroys much of proper national life, causes extra powers to accumulate in the nation as a whole. The consequent ethical remedy for this is to drain them by means of a fast. These fasts were also instituted as a reminder that the use of the extra powers for evil caused us to lose our national happiness. His interests are lyre and lute, timbrel, flute and wine, but who never give a thought to the plan of the Lord and take no note of what he is designing. Assuredly, my people will suffer exile for not giving heed. This is from Ishayahu 5.12. As for dreams, from a clear perspective of the knowledge, from a clear perspective of the knowledge of the Lord, we are led to conclude that our inner world is conducted in ways no less accurate and precise than the external world. Therefore, it is impossible that the state of dreaming, which takes up a considerable part, a considerable part of life, is not bound in a secure knot to life as a whole both physical and ethical. I'm just going to read that sentence again. Therefore it is impossible that the state of dreaming, which takes up a considerable part of life, is not bound in a secure knot to life as a whole, both physical and ethical. And since, as a general rule, it is impossible for a person correctly to perceive his inner state, his true relation to the divine ideas, which is the basis for happiness and ethics, his inclination towards happiness and good as such, not as the result of any external cause, and to know, according to this, the value of his powers in regard to their use and needs, such an inner inclination is therefore better recognized in, in an instinctive way, so that not only the rational mind recognizes it. The power of free imagination, together with rational analysis, put the matters in their proper place, and clarify the impressions which stem from the innermost content of the self-conscious. Dreams are indeed the most reliable key to an honest heart. 
since this is the content of the perception of dreams and of the soul's inner emotions as a whole. Footnote. Dreams are a way of expressing instinctive emotions which can be recognized only subconsciously. In this, Ralph Cook's attitude is in agreement with modern psychology. However, while modern psychology stresses how, stru- sorry, stresses low, I'll start that sentence again. However, while modern psychology stresses low animal-like drives as the basis of dreams, Ralph Cook sees dreams as expressing the most lofty emotion of man, the spiritual desire for the love of God. Back to the text. And with regard to dream fasts, footnote. A dream fast is a voluntary fast undertaken after a bad dream. By fasting one hopes to avert the dream's bad portent. There is some dispute among the sages as to how important dreams are. Rav Chenina Bar says, A dream is a type of prophecy. This is Bereshit Rabbah 17.5. And Rav asserts, Fasting is as, pot- is as potent against a dream as fire against broken flax. That's from Shabbat 11a. On the other hand, Rav Yonatan states, a man is shown in a dream only what is suggested by his own thoughts. This is from Barachot 55b. Rav Meir says, Dreams are of no consequence. Horiot 13b. And Rav Shimon Bar Yochai says, Just as there can be no grain without straw, so there is no dream without meaningless content. This is from Barachot 55a. Back to the text. text. And with regard to dream fasts, in general, it is proper to give respectable place in life to the feelings of the soul as they are, without too much sophistication, for this is the essence of the true wisdom of life. Therefore, when the psychological state demands that a man fulfill its need by means of some form of voluntary suffering or affliction, of which fasting is the most natural, then it is worthy to make a place for it. And the same applies to the value of a fast in remembrance of a dear and beloved soul. Footnote. This refers to the custom, custom of fasting on a yacht site, the anniversary of the death of a parent. Uh, see Nedarim 12a. Back to the text. And it, also, and it applies also to any similar fasts. Indeed, with regard to Yom Kippur, we must note that the divine thought includes every idea, new and old, and therefore, any way or anything found to be good can assuredly be ascribed to the interpretation of the Torah. And in general, this is the way of the Torah. It hints at a principle from which we can draw a wellspring of general ethical perceptions and knowledge. In order to set for ourselves an eternal way of life by means of all these righteous statutes and judgments. As for other theories regarding matters of the soul that are beyond the limits of ethical and practical life, even though we are unable to refute them, still we should not draw ways of life from them. This is forbidden, according to our holy Torah which removed us from immersion in vague visions. When it is prohibited, sorry, when it prohibited all sorts of sorcery and necromancy. It's in Deuteronomy 18.10. Uh, forbade the priest to become impure from the dead and tied all the commandments to life. And it is said in the Jerusalem Talmud, so that you, your son, and your son's son may revere the Lord your God and follow as long as you live days that, are, that you are engaged in the living and not days in which you are engaged in the dead. This is from Jerusalem Talmud Brachot chapter 3. And the verse is from Deuteronomy 6.2. The world which is removed from the practical life should be fuller and loftier than the limited life. But if we draw actions, manners or ideas that affect the community from it, this will certainly defile the mind. Therefore, even the prophets prophesied only about the days of the Mashiach, of the Messiah, but not about the world to come. For since the beginning of the world men have not heard nor perceived by ear, neither has the eye seen, neither has the eye seen them, O God, but you. It's from Brachot 34b, and the verse is from Ishayahu 64.3. I have included in these short, words the, these short words the main principles of my views regarding the questions raised in your letter. May you forgive my brevity since I cannot elaborate on the issues now as I am very busy. And may I say peace and blessing as is the wish of you and me who, inquis, who inquires after your well-being with love. Humbly yours, Avraham Yitzchak Hakohen Cook, Igrat 79.